Good morning, folks. It's time for us to begin our class here in the auditorium at the Vaughn Park Church of Christ. Enjoy the fellowship. I'll invite folks to come on in and find a seat. Uh, there's plenty available. Even though there's a lot of them are taped off, there's still plenty of seats. Uh, those of you that are still sitting at home, your season tickets are good. We may have rearranged the seats on you, but you can still come. We'll be glad to have you. I appreciate everybody being here this morning and for those who are watching online. I want to remind you that we are in the, the Bible app, and if you have that app on your phone, you can follow along, uh, find the notes there. Uh, the scriptures are there also that we may touch upon, as well as some questions for further study uh, as you go along uh, through, through the study uh, through this week. I want to remind you that uh, last Sunday was the first Sunday of the month, and we were to take up our collection for our support of Millie and Angel at the City of Children. A lot of folks remembered that and were able to do that, and if you didn't, uh, you can make up today. Uh, we were a little short from what our goal is of $600 each month. Uh, last week we were short, and so we've got some room to make up uh, as we go through. But I want to remind you of that. As we continue our study of the Great Commission in the book of Acts and the making of disciples, we want to look today at Acts chapter 8. But in so doing, I want to make us uh, kind of give us a reminder the Great Commission is found in Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, Luke chapter 24, Acts chapter 1. And if we put all of these passages together, basically it says that the Great Commission is that they, we, are to go into all the world. That we're to preach the gospel to every person, every creature. Repentance and remission of sins must be preached in the name of Jesus. Uh, that uh, belief and baptism are involved and in salvation for those who, are, who do believe and are uh, baptized. And they were to begin in Jerusalem and Judea and then go to the rest of the world. In Acts chapter 2, the church began. Sorry, I went the wrong direction there. For these in the crowd, here we go. In Acts chapter 2, the church began in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, 49 days after his resurrection. And on that day, Peter preached the first gospel sermon that looked at very carefully in Acts chapter 2. Over 3,000 obeyed the gospel that day. And the Lord was adding daily after that those that were being saved. And so they began in Jerusalem and sort of in Judea. Because Jerusalem was in Judea. And at the Passover and then later at Pentecost, there were thousands of people who did not live in Jerusalem who had come from distant uh, nations. Uh, if you react to Acts chapter 2, about verse 11, they came from Rome, Parthia, Media, Asia, Cilicia, Pontus, Galatia, uh, Cyrene, North Africa. They'd come from all over the world to come to Jerusalem for the Passover, and they stayed for Pentecost. There wasn't a Motel 6. The light wasn't even on then. And so there was no place to stay, so they camped around Jerusalem. And they stayed in the villages and little small cities around Jerusalem, as far out as Bethany, even perhaps Jericho. And so as the gospel was begun or began to be preached in Jerusalem, as the church began there, as the church began to grow, it began to fill out or flow out of the limits of Jerusalem into the areas around and thus sort of, I say, into Judea. In Acts chapter 2, we read that they continued steadfastly, the new Christians, in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayer. They were constantly learning, constantly studying. And because of that, many who had possessions sold what they had and were giving their possessions to those who had need. They weren't just giving them out to whoever wanted them, but they were taking care of those who had travel distances, whose budget had run out, and they were thus in some kind of severe need. And of course, in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, the church was of one heart and of one soul. They were united as a body in Jesus Christ. And then also the Lord, and this is said in chapter 2, but it's also implied to other places, the Lord was adding daily those who were being saved. On a constant basis, they were making disciples as they went around from house to house, from temple to house to court to pools to wherever they went. They were preaching Jesus. And then we saw in chapter 6 that trouble began. As certain of the, the widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food and necessary supplies. 
And so the apostles said, well, you select seven men and let these seven men uh, take care of this need. And so thus they did. And Stephen was one of those men. And here we go. He was one of the deacons who was selected to serve and take care of these widows in need. But Stephen was also a preacher. He was gifted to preach. And in his preaching, he was challenged by the synagogue of the freedmen, those from Cyrenia and from Alexandria. Remember Sil uh, Simon from Cyrene was the one selected by the Roman soldiers to carry the cross of Jesus after he fell, not under its weight so much, but out of the exhaustion that he had experienced the night before since he'd eaten the Last Supper with the Twelve. Some of those who challenged Stephen to argue with him were from Cilicia and from Asia. Keep Cilicia in mind, as we'll come back to that later on. They brought Stephen before the Jewish Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court. They accused him of blasphemy. They accused him of speaking against the law, of speaking against the temple. But Stephen answered them with a great historical sermon. And in that answer, he preached to them Jesus. He explained to them that they followed their ancestors, the fathers of the Jewish nation, who had through the centuries persecuted the prophets that God had sent to call them back to him, to bring them back into a relationship with him. And then he said, you took Jesus, the son, and crucified him. Because of their, his accusation, they, chapter 7 says, verse uh, 57, they cried out with a loud voice. They covered their ears and they rushed at him with one impulse. When they'd driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning him until they stoned him to death. The process of stoning, as described in the law of Moses, and it probably antedates that, <clears throat> but the process of stoning was this. An individual is accused of a crime. He's condemned to death. The first witness, remember the law says, two or three witnesses. One witness is not enough. But the first witness casts the first stone. They take the individual condemned to death, they take him to a high point, maybe to the top of the city wall, or, or maybe the city's built on a hill and they have somewhere where they can push him off. The first witness throws the first stone. Now, folks, this is not driveway gravel. This is not the smooth stone you take and you skip across the lake or the pond. These are stones. These are the stones you'll find that the state uses along the side of the highway to prevent erosion. These are the stones that you might have decorating around a fountain or a bird bath in the front yard. A two-handed stone that takes all you got to pick it up. The intention of this is not to throw gravel, but to kill an individual. And so they used large stones. The first witness threw the first stone. The second witness threw the second stone. The third witness threw the third stone. Then everyone in town threw a stone. Go back to Joshua chapter 7. Achan of the tribe of Judah had kept something out of the city of Jericho, caused difficulties for the Israelites as they tried to conquer Bethel and Ai. When he was discovered, identified by God through the lot, he was taken and the whole nation stoned him. They raised a great heap of stones. Now, if you think about that, if you're the first witness, you're going to be very careful about your testimony because you've got to throw the first stone. You've got to live with that. But the fact that everybody participates kind of drives in the fact that we really don't want to be guilty of what he did because we don't want the punishment that he got. So it kind of had a, a, a good effect on everyone. But <clears throat> this raises a question. Why was Jesus taken to Pilate by the Jews in fear of the Roman power for the Romans to put Jesus to death? And Pilate said, you take care of it. This is your business, not mine. And they said in John 18, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. So why did they take Jesus to Pilate, but they ran Stephen out of the city and stoned him? Why not take him to Pilate? What changed? <clears throat> when Caesar, Pompey, 
came in and conquered Judah and Israel, Palestine, 60-something years or so before Jesus was born. He was so impressed by the Jewish religion and their law that he allowed them to practice their law at their own discretion but he would not allow them to use capital punishment. They were not allowed to put a person to death. And that's because the Romans put a great deal of importance on the fact of, or the idea of Roman citizenship. A person who, ha- who was born a Roman citizen or who had bought his citizenship had special rights, and one of which capital punishment was not allowed unless designed or ordered by the Caesar at the time. So they were very protected. And so just that killing was not allowed. And so the Jews were not allowed to exercise capital punishment. Pilate, when he came in as governor, came into a very volatile circumstance or situation. The Jews had had several rebellions. Remember Gamaliel in chapter 5 mentions Thutis and Judas. And then Barsabbas, the one who was, or Barabbas rather, the one who was released in favor of the Jews instead of Jesus, had led an insurrection in the city, a rebellion against Rome. So Rome was looking at Pilate from one side, saying, don't let anything happen. And the Jews, who did not like Pilate, were on the other side. And so there was a conflict, and Pilate was kind of caught in the middle. Therefore, that situation. But just a quick look at the Roman governors. <clears throat> Pilate came to Rome, to Judea around 30 AD when Jesus was crucified. Now I know we say 33, but there's a four year mistake in our chronology. We're actually four years off, so this should actually be 2025. Now, I've said it before and said, oh, that means I'll be, no. You'll be the same age you are now, just the years are different. Yeah, but if you add four years, now we're not adding four years. We've got a four-year mistake way back in the chronology, and it's easier to live with it than to try to change it. So Jesus was actually born about 4 B.C. by our chronology. So don't worry about that. It's another story. So Pilate came to Judea around 30 and governed for about six years. He was recalled to Rome. And different traditions have different ideas, but... Some say, and most of them agree, that Pilate actually went insane, bothered by his conscience over the crucifixion of Jesus in whom he could find no fault. Some say he went to this, was exiled to this position in France, another uh, he left and went here, uh, and he committed suicide, but that's Pilate, and you can look that up. He was replaced by Marcellus, who was a governor for about a year. Marcellus was not really a governor. In fact, Josephus calls him overseer, not governor. He called, he's more of a person put in there as an interim between Pilate and the next guy who was Marullus. And Marcellus was not really a Roman presence or governor in Jerusalem. It seems like he stayed in Caesarea and just kind of held down the fort there. So that means that there was no serious Roman presence in Jerusalem at the time Stephen was stoned because he was stoned after Pilate left. So Stephen was stoned seven or so years after the church began on Acts chapter 2. And after Marullus, King Herod Agrippa I that we'll run into in chapter 12 was sort of the governor of uh, Judea. And he was, by the way, a descendant of Herod the Great, the one who tried to kill the infant Jesus. And if you want to have a very, um, I'll put it this way, if you really want to lose your appetite before lunch, read the story of Herod the Great and the ideas or the things that he did to glorify himself and execute his wives and his children. Very, very brutal man. But anyway, that's, that's that. So that explains why there are seven years or so between Stephen and the day of Pentecost. So seven years had passed by. There was no real Roman influence in Jerusalem. The governor kind of just didn't care. And so it was okay then, or allowable then, or at least they got away with, taking St- Stephen out of the city and stoning him to death. But... Of the Cilicians, 
those from the province of Cilicia, of which Tarsus was a major city. In the Sanhedrin was a young man named Saul. And he's introduced here, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a freeborn Roman citizen, which gives him extra special privileges. But he was in the Sanhedrin. It means he was very well educated. He was a student of Gamaliel they were ran into in chapter uh, 5. So let's read Acts chapter 8, the first three verses together. Saul, and he's introduced in verse uh, 56, or 58 rather, of chapter 7. He was the one who held the coats of the witnesses. Folks, that means he's right there by the stoning. He wasn't standing off at a distance. He was right close by. They, they wore long flowing robes. Kind of difficult to throw a large rock with that much cloth on. So they took off their outer cloaks and gave them to Saul to hold while they threw their rock at Stephen. Saul was in a hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Verse 3. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house to ha after house, and dragging off men and women, he would put them in prison. Now, skip verse 2 on purpose. It says, some devout men, meanwhile, while Saul was doing the persecuting, they took Stephen... They buried him and made a loud lamentation over him. They mourned over his death. But Saul began this persecution. Now, I want you to get one thing straight. Saul was a Jew. He was not a Roman. He was a Roman citizen. The persecution that he led was not led by the Roman government. This was led by the Jews against the church. As far as the Romans saw the Jewish nation, they saw them divided into Pharisees and Sadducees, the Zealots, who were against the Roman government, the Herodians, who supported the Roman government. That was more of a political issue. Pharisees and Sadducees was more of a religious issue. And the Essenes, they were the weird ones. They lived in communes. They did not practice marriage, but they did take orphan children and they raised them, such as John the Baptist. There was a large Essene community at Qumran who copied the Dead Sea Scrolls. There was another Essene com communion or commune at Magdala on the coast of the western coast Sea of Galilee from which came Mary Magdalene. Okay, so they were the odd ones who just, they're kind of separate from everybody else. But again, And for the Romans, they saw this new group called the Christians. So they did not see the Christians anything different than just Jews are causing trouble. Until after Judaism was destroyed in AD 70, and the Christians remained, then the Romans began their persecution of the church. So right here when we're reading the book of Acts, this is the Jews persecuting the church. And Saul was dragging people out into the street and putting them in prison. Not Roman prison, but Jewish prison. The basement of the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, was the Jewish jail. And that's where Jesus was put for at least a brief period of time during his trials between Annas and Caiaphas and so forth. Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. He was in a hearty agreement with them. The persecution was not by the Romans, but by the Jews. Verse said that. And verse 1, they, they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 to the apostles, verse 8, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. Here we go. Now they move completely out of Jerusalem and they go to Judea and Samaria on purpose. Not the 12. 
The 12 stayed in Jerusalem. So when they went, as they were scattered, verse 4 says, those that were scattered went about preaching the word. They went around preaching Jesus. You say, well, wait a minute, it says preaching the word. John 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, the word. And the word, verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus. That which we have seen, which we have heard, which we've looked upon, which our hands have handled, of the word of life. 1 John 1, Jesus is the word. Wherever they went, they went preaching. It wasn't the twelve. It was the common sitting in the pew Christian. They weren't the ones gifted like Stephen to preach. But they went everywhere preaching Jesus. They were doing the very thing that you and I need to do. We say, well, well, I, I can't preach. There weren't any pulpits. The pulpit didn't come about for a number of years. Like second century. They didn't have pulpits. They are going house to house. We would do it sitting around dining room tables. In the living room. Feet propped up on the coffee table. In the front yard as we walk by on our afternoon stroll. Stopping and speaking to a neighbor about Jesus. That's how they did it. And they did it in such a way that many people were hearing and listening to the word of God. Continue to read. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 5. Philip, back up to chapter 6. Philip was one of the seven, like Stephen. Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now, from Jerusalem... When you leave town, you're going down. Now, our concept is if we go from here to Nashville, you're going up. If you go to Mobile, you're going down. Their concept was if you're in Jerusalem, everything is down because it's downhill. Just Jerusalem is up higher than anything. So a man went up from Jericho to Jerusalem. Jesus was going up to Jerusalem because of the altitude, 2,000 feet or so above sea level. And when you go out of Jerusalem, you're going down. So that's how they saw this. So Philip went down to Samaria. Samaria was the ancient capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. The city was built and established by Amri, the father of Ahab, as, one, as the one, two, three, fourth capital, if I got them right, of, of the, north, the divided kingdom of Israel, principal city then. And he began pre proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in the city just because of the healings that Philip had done. Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city. By the way, if you read about Simon, he's called Simon Magus or Simon Magnus. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Simon formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, uh, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God, talking about Stephen, or excuse me, Simon. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, men and women alike. And even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. As he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Philip was one of the seven. He went down to Samaria and began preaching Jesus and performed a number of miracles. There was a great deal of rejoicing in the city because Philip came with this great power. And those who believed were baptized. Thus they obtained their salvation in Jesus Christ. And then we're introduced to Simon Magus, or Simon Magnus. 
The word for magic in Greek is magus, or magus, if you want to put it that way. That's where we get our word magician. That's what Simon was. And with his black magic, his magical arts, his sleight of hand, he, he had convinced the people. Bear in mind, they were in a very superstitious time. He convinced the people that he had some great power. They believed he had the power of some great God, maybe God Almighty. And he was a, a man of great attention in town. He was very important. When he spoke, everyone listened. And what he recommended, everyone did because of his power over them with his magical arts. And, and magic, for those who can do it, for those who don't, it's amazing. How do they do that? How can they pull that off? How do they saw a person in half and put them back together again? All these kind of things that they do. It's sleight of hand. It's trickery. But for those who can't figure it out, you know, the, the card tricks, the, there's a method to that. And those who can do magic, it's fun. I, I teach, when I teach the little children the parable of the talents, I get three of them up there and I count, I have play money, I count five pieces and put them in a the bag, and hand them the bag. I count two pieces, put it in a bag, hand it to the second child. I put one piece in the third bag, hand it to that child. I take the first child's bag away. Of course, they don't know what's in there. They just want me to put five pieces in there. I pour out ten. How do you do that? You take the second kid's bag and you pour out four. The other kid's feeling his bag to see how many is in there, trying to figure out how does he do that. Well, simply the, ba the other coins, the extra coins are already in the bag. They just don't know that. To them, it's amazing. How do you do that? They're tricked by sleight of hand. Simon was doing just that. But when Philip came preaching the gospel, when Philip came preaching Jesus and had the power of the Holy Spirit to do these miracles, to heal these people, and it wasn't people who were brought in by Philip. These were people who lived there. These were people that they knew, that they realized were sick, were lame, were crippled. And they saw that this power that Philip had was greater than that power that Simon professed to have. And we'll run into Simon a little bit deeper uh, next week. But look at this as we try to conclude today. They went around preaching Jesus. Again, no pulpits, no special lessons, no outlines. And believe it or not, no Bible. They couldn't carry the Bible with them. They could not carry the Gospel of Matthew because it hadn't been written yet. It's going to be another 13 years before Matthew pins his Gospel, the first of the accounts. Mark wrote around 68. Luke wrote his about 62. Uh, maybe 58, uh, John wrote his around 90 A.D. So, so that's years before the gospel accounts are written out. So they didn't have the complete knowledge like, like we think we have. They didn't have the book of Acts to preach from. They didn't have Paul's letters to teach from. But what they did teach, they taught what they knew. They had continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They heard what they had been taught, and they carried that with them. And here's the neat thing, folks. They were asked questions they could not answer. And they all could say, I don't know. There's no shame in saying, I don't know. I don't know is an acceptable answer. You don't have to know it all. You don't have to have the Bible memorized. You don't have to have an answer to every single question. But you do need to have an answer for the hope that is in you. And that is that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But now we have the scriptures written. We can lay them out and say, look and read with me. Look and read with me. I'm not going to try to teach you. You teach yourself as we read together. If you take that approach, 
you take away all you take away all of the pressure. Let's read and study together. I, I'm going to make this accusation. I think I'm right. Gus Nichols is accused of having said, "If you start and have a question about the Bible, if you start in Genesis and read Revelation, you'll find the answer. If you missed it, read it over again. You missed it somewhere. It's in there." Good thought. We have a question about the Bible. Study it and find it. We're so quick to say, well, I don't know. I, I just don't know how to find out. Well, take up and read. Take up and read. Second, the people heard the preaching of Jesus and they believed. They didn't believe because of the miracle. They didn't believe because of the knowledge. They believed because of the truth of Jesus Christ. People long for truth. Many of us are fed up with the lies that are being told from all sides. We want the truth. Pure, simple, unadulterated truth. The truth is, Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He was dead, buried, resurrected, sits now at the right hand of God, reigning as King of Kings, and Lord of Lords, anticipating a time when the Father will say, go, bring them home. At which point the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, and we'll meet Jesus in the air. That's all you got to know. That's all you got to say. And then open the scripture, and let them find their answers. Those that heard and those who believed, they were baptized. We talked several, some, I think last year, about the simplicity of baptism and why God requires water baptism. It's a washing, not so much of the filth of the body, but it's a physical act that demonstrates an inward obedience that, that demonstrates to God that we're willing to give everything we have to him and serve him the rest of our lives. It's a moment of dedication. A couple stands before the minister. I do, I do. Married. One flesh. It's a commitment that they make to each other. That's what baptism is. It's a commitment to follow Jesus. And in that physical act, there's the spiritual act where God takes the blood of Jesus and He doesn't cover our sins. He washes them away and they exist no more. It's like hitting the delete button on the, on the computer. It's gone. And there's not a quick key that you can get to make it come back. It's disappeared forever. And God has forgiven and God has forgotten. Our trouble is we want to remember I have a scar right here on my knuckle that my father cut me with a knife. And it was by accident. We were skinning a goat, going to barbecue him. I was pulling on the skin and dad was cutting and his hand moved, missed or something, and the knife hit my knuckle. I could see bone. Of course, it was about an hour later before I discovered what had happened and I realized that the blood on my arm was not from the goat, it was from me. I would put a bandage on it. I have a scar. I have a memory. But there was forgiveness and the act was forgotten. And the scar reminds me the next time I'm skinning a goat, be sure that I keep my hand away from that knife. And the scars of our sins remind us that don't do that again. But God has forgotten it because God has forgiven it. And that's part of the baptism. And they were made disciples. A disciple is a student, a learner, a follower, one who walks with us in the footsteps of Jesus. And folks, that's what we need to be, and that's what we need to do 
must follow the Great Commission by striving to make disciples. And we can do that, we think, the best by our church's mission and vision statement, by living for Him, speaking about Him, and serving in His name. If we will work together and do that, our church will grow. We will grow in faith in Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for watching online. May this lesson be a blessing to you. We're dismissed.